So as most of you know, I've been sharing the advice and teachings for about 30 years now. And sometimes I'm tempted to stop teaching because, of course, very few people in the bigger picture, very few people are really interested. Unfortunately, most of humanity is living their lives completely asleep. And very few people, unfortunately, ever put the priority to wake up. So being a teacher is sometimes not so easy because dealing with a world which is asleep is not very exciting. But at this moment, besides my radioactive blood, I can also say that our recent retreat in Spain, this recent 10-day retreat, I want to thank the people that came because we had roughly 10 from the community and we had 10 guests from outside. And somehow what came together was a tremendous chemistry. And I think most people had a really wonderful, fun time, but also it was very intensive and I was able to go very deep. And this was for me very, very satisfying. And uh, uh, now, in, in, in uh, starting tomorrow evening here in Germany, back in our uh, beautiful house in Hittor, uh, we're going to have an outer Sanger weekend. And we have about 20 people coming for this weekend, the same number we had in the retreat. And um, again, I'm very touched from some of these new people because I feel um, that many of these new people are in fact very touched inside, even if they don't quite understand yet what it's all about, and they're trusting some deeper inner uh, intuition, which is very beautiful because this is not so common. So having said that, I thought I would like, I would like to tell you that in this summer, in the next uh, two months until September, when we have a, another long retreat in Denia for two weeks this time, um, I'm going to, to go into this book. So this, this book called The Great Misunderstanding, I think was published, uh, wow, already 12 years ago. I published this 12 years ago. So this is the basic teachings as interpreted in very simple English by John David. But they're not John David's teachings. They're what John David has discovered over a long life. So this is the book we're going to go through in the next two months. Um, and last month, if you remember, I uh, last two months, actually, I went through this book, The Pointless Joy of Freedom, and basically the book we're going to go through now, this book is the more simple book, and this was a bit more complicated book. So we've done the advanced book last month, and I'm going back now to a more simple beginner's book for the next two months. But the teaching is the same. And then I wanted to tell you that for the very advanced people, because we have one or two very advanced people, uh, I think already earlier this year, I spent a lot of time um, going into this book from Ramana Mahashi. So this is not John David's book. This is Ramana Mahashi's book. And if, if you remember, there is a, a story how this was a manuscript that was written by a young Indian man 80 years ago when he was living, when he was staying in the ashram in South India. So this, this is highly recommended and particularly for advanced people or people who are ready to jump in. So this is, uh, this is the most beautiful book. And since we published it, uh, I think it was two years ago now, time goes really quick, already three years ago, uh, no, two years ago, yeah, we published it two years ago. And if you go on Amazon, you'll find some wonderful reviews where people are even daring to say that this may be the best book from Ramana. So this is, of course, very touching. And at the moment, we're starting to plan two more books 
from this original manuscript. One will be on the subject of self-inquiry and the other will be on the subject of devotion. So these three books I would like to suggest uh, are what you need to read and need to understand and need to pop into sometimes to get a reminder. And the other book I highly recommend is from my own teacher. And this, this book maybe I will go through later in the year. It's called The Truth Is. And this is a record of Pabaji's satsangs. And this is, uh, in my opinion, a, a, wonderful, a wonderful book. And Papaji, for those of you who don't know, he was a direct disciple of Ramana Mahashi. And then while I was looking tonight for these books, the books that I would really like to draw your attention to, um, I found another book jumping out of my bookcase. And this is called The Miracle of Love. So this is not advice of a dancer. This is devotion. This is a book about bhakti, devotion. And this is a wonderful book because wherever you pick up the book and whichever page you go to, um, it's full of wonderful things. So right here, there's a subtitle which says, the guru must know everything about you. Wow, that's pretty shocking. The guru must know everything about you. What does that mean even? teacher you have to you have to stand naked not literally naked of course but you have to be ready to expose yourself all the bits that you don't want to expose you need to expose you see and never lie to the teacher that's really not a good idea so this is a wonderful book this was um, constructed by um, Ram Das, who's a, perhaps one of the most famous American spiritual teachers, who went to India looking for his own teacher. And out of a series of miracles, he came across this man, Neem Karoli Baba. And um, this is the book which he constructed uh, from devotees of Neem Karoli Baba after Neem Karoli Baba had passed away. He collected lots of stories about Neem Karoli Baba. And this, this is one of the most beautiful books you can ever read because this is just like pure love, pure love. And almost any page in this book, you have to cry. The only way to read this book is with a big box of tissues because this is love. And we have to cry about love, of course. Okay, so ha ha ha. That was fun. So now to this book, The Great Misunderstanding. And uh, before, before I come into the first chapter, I want to bring your attention, because I hope you will get a copy of this book, to this diagram. So this is, this is the seven chakras. Okay, This is a, a diagram of the seven chakras, which you've never seen before like this. Because when we were doing the book, I redesigned the graphic of the chakras with a very uh, clever artist called Sangeeta, who was living in the community. And together we produced these diagrams. So the first chakra, which is what we're going to deal with tonight at the bottom, it shows a diagram in red with the energy down. So the energy is coming from the earth up into the physical body. And we show that with this particular symbol. And equally, at the top of the head is the seventh chakra. And we show the opposite, that the energy is coming down into the body from the top. So we show almost like a crown on the top. Um, <clears throat> and as you go through the other chakras, we have... Um, well, I won't go into the details of them now, but these are the seven chakras, the seven energy centers of the body. And each chapter in this book is based on one of those energy centers, uh, as it was in my other book. <clears throat> okay. 
So what is this great misunderstanding? This is the fundamental question. This is also the fundamental truth of Advaita. What is this great misunderstanding? <clears throat> Imagine the waves of the ocean. If you identify with a wave and you look out at all the other waves, naturally you feel separate from the other waves. If you really understand it, all those waves are always part of the ocean. They are never separate from the ocean and we are never separate from consciousness. Very simple, very, very simple. So this is, <clears throat> this is the fundament of the spiritual understanding and it's the fundament of, of advice of Vedanta. You see, and unfortunately, when I say people are asleep, unfortunately, most people believe themselves to be a wave, a separate wave. And they have no concept at all, or no understanding at all, that in fact, we are all one. At this retreat in Spain, we sat together in a circle and we experienced for ourselves this tremendous feeling of oneness. We are all one. You see, this is what's so amazingly beautiful. And what's been very beautiful in the Open Sky House for the last 20 years is we've been living with something like uh, 16, 18, 20 people over these 20 years, different people. But living together in this oneness, understanding the oneness, you see, very beautiful, which is why when you would come and visit our community, you immediately, when you walk in through the front door, you feel this enormous energy, you see, this energy of love, because this fundamental ocean, which we are all one, consciousness, is also love. This is love. This is amazing because love is the fundament. It doesn't mean what we think of as when we say, I love you. Please never say I love you to somebody. That's really a horrible thing. That's not anything to do with love. That's a horrible society nightmare. I love you. I love you. That means one over here loves one who's over there. Two separates loving each other. And as you, many of you know, because some of you are a bit older, this doesn't really work. And unfortunately, the suffering, most of the suffering in the world comes from that basic misunderstanding. <clears throat> you all understand this? Ha, ha, ha. Do you? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I know somebody on this, some people on this screen definitely don't, but hopefully you might soon. So I'm going to read a few selected paragraphs from this first chapter, but there are many other good chapters in the first chapter, which you can yourself read and digest. Imagine that when a baby is in the womb, it experiences no sense of separation. It's quite easy to understand that because the baby is inside the mother's body. The, the baby is connected through a tube to the mother. It's energetically part of the mother. And so it's very easy to see that this baby is not separate from the mother. It's one with the mother. That's kind of easy to see and absolutely obvious. So then what happens when the baby pops out? So in the beginning, the good practice would be that the baby uh, comes and sits on the mother or is held by the mother. And so initially for some time, that baby feels still one with the mother, one with the ocean. 
you see, because there's there's no separation. But unfortunately, due to the way we we uh, uh, things happen in our in our society, as we start to grow, as this baby starts to grow up, there's more and more separation. And so after some time, that little baby who came out feeling absolutely one with everything, suddenly, gradually, gradually is conditioned to be separate. So this is this is a human tragedy. So this identification where we identify as a wave rather than the ocean is what we call the ego. We're identifying with something that we ourselves have constructed through the normal processes of growing up and the influences of family, friends, society, religion, and culture. This is completely natural. And of course, if everyone around us is busy constructing their ego, then we would put all our efforts into it also. Within society, there is so much support for the ego that we don't see the construction or that it is false. So if you're coming out of a very ambitious family, then, of course, your whole effort is to develop your ego, to become more powerful, become more rich, to become more famous, become more beautiful, whatever your ego is particularly interested in, we put a lot of energy then into that. And that, of course, makes even more separation. More separation. And if you want to have a very terrible example of somebody who has developed his ego very, very strongly, then I can't think of anybody worse than Mr. Trump who is a completely terrible potential president of America. So if you follow what this guy does in his life and how he behaves, you will discover he's complete egomaniac, complete egomaniac. And unfortunately, he's not the only one. It's very common. A man late for an important meeting was searching desperately for a parking spot in a crowded car park. Looking up to the sky, he entreated, Lord, if you find me a parking spot, I promise to start going to church again. Ha uh -huh. The words were barely out of his mouth when a spot opened up right in front of his car. The man looked back up, never mind, I found one. You see? And this is how we live our life, you see? This is a kind of macabre joke because actually many of us are living our lives like that, you see. <clears throat> So the reason we don't see that we're always part of consciousness and that we can surrender, if you like, to this consciousness is because uh, we are so identified with the false self. Everything that you believe and all your ideas and judgments are simply in the way. You are conditioned with certain ideas. You call them my ideas. But if you really start to examine them, you quickly discover that most of them are really other people's ideas, which you are simply repeating. When something happens in your life, you react from those ideas and beliefs. That's more or less how we all live. If you are very honest, you can see that you are a kind of conditioned robot. That's not so comfortable, of course. 
And of course, when I look at the screen tonight, I don't really see any robots. It's very beautiful for me personally. Now I'm becoming very old. And because I see you are not robots, I can't stop teaching, you see. I've got to keep going. I've got to keep going. It's really, in one way, terrible. I always imagine by now, when I'm nearly 80, I'd be sitting in the sun somewhere uh, drinking gin tonics. Uh, but now, uh, no gin tonics and uh, uh, water. Ha, ha, ha. I was even planning my life of gin tonics. In my kitchen, I've got about 10 different kinds of gin, all kinds of kind of exotic gin I was collecting for my old age, you know. And they sit in my kitchen, and unfortunately, only water, only water. So the reality is that we were never separate. We've always been part of the whole. It may not appear like that because when you look around, you see many bodies and it's easy to feel that you are separate. But if you really understand, then it's not like that. You would never consider the waves to be separate from the ocean. And in the same way, you are never separate from consciousness. You are absolutely one with it. And there's a beautiful quote, actually, I just remembered from the cover on the back of this book, which is from uh, Ramana Mahashi. You may imagine to yourself that you've parted from God, but know that he never parts from you. Again, very, very simple, but this is like the the fundament of Advaita is the fundament to understand what's going on on this planet. What are we all doing? We're all one and we're all absolutely part of existence. And you can't not be. If you think you can be, we can discuss it in a minute. If somebody would like to, to, to show me how you can be here and not be part of existence, I would be very interested. Maybe there's a few waves who, you know, kicking around without any ocean around, but I don't think so. But maybe I pause now for a bit. Uh, anybody like to um, ask something, say something, have a dialogue? Maybe I read out what Rahul has written because he's written something in the chat. Okay. That is, I understand theoretically, but I still feel separate. Yeah, you feel separate because of the deep conditioning you're part of. The people around you, I don't know, of course, much about your life and who is around you, but probably the people are most of the people around you are completely living as they're separate. They don't even consider that they might not be separate. So mm -hmm. very easy then to consider that you yourself are separate. You come and spend a week in our community or a bit longer maybe, you can quickly discover that that's not the case. And many people when they come into the open sky house, uh, maybe not quite understanding what's going on, but they feel something enormously different from what they normally feel in their daily life. And what they're feeling is that we live this way, this, sorry, not, not a way, we live in this ocean and we give, uh, we give it our identity, if you like. And so mm -hmm. we are ocean, ocean travelers ocean travelers here in the open sky house and i think rahu you you were here maybe last year for a weekend and that weekend probably you got a taste of that mm -hmm. is that right yeah i think i was there twice three times first time i came for the vipassana island right right and then for the weekend 
and right. then for the volunteer week. But say that again, the last thing. Uh, last uh, one week for the volunteer week from Monday through Friday, I think. Right. And if I remember, uh, you were quite touched in that week. Oh, yes. You, you felt something like I'm talking about. Is that right? Yeah. And now you live in Berlin, is it right? Uh, Potsdam, yeah, Berlin. Potsdam, yeah, well, that part of Berlin, I think, right. Mm -hmm. you have a new relationship since you were here. I think I met also the lady in your life. Mm -hmm. And so you're doing your thing together, probably. And I don't know anything else really about you. But I think you can understand what I'm saying, because this thing that I'm talking about tonight is so incredibly simple, actually. And mm -hmm. it's so obvious. And this metaphor of the ocean with the waves is so simple and yet so clear. So maybe in your daily life, you don't have people around you who are acting as a mirror to remind you, but you can just keep this image of the ocean and the wave. Yes. It's not very spiritual, you know, it's not a great spiritual treatise, but it's a very clear metaphor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt that way maybe a couple of times in my life when I was really meditating a lot. Uh, the ocean thing, like the, the feeling of connectedness. Uh, but like recently, the past one year, I just feel very, I don't know, that I'm operating through my ego all the time. And I'm very burnt out. I don't feel recovered. I feel drained a lot of the time. Okay, I mean, perhaps you are looking on the outside for your girlfriend or your wife, I don't know, um, to love you. Is that uh, possible? That's not the main reason. No? I think it's more to do with uh, me living up to my potential. I feel like I'm not doing that, and that kind of eats at me from within. Does that well, make sense? I can say to you, for example, it's very nice that you're on this meeting tonight, but actually a year has passed, more or less, mm -hmm. since I saw you. Maybe you have a teacher in Potsdam or in Berlin. I think quite a lot of teachers come to Berlin, but it may be that you're too busy in your daily life that you don't go to these teachers. You don't get reminded. Mm -hmm. I don't know your life, of course. That could be it, yes. Like, I'm mostly working or going to German classes, like trying to be productive as much as I can. Right, right. Anyway, I'm planning to make these meetings every Thursday mm -hmm. uh, through the next two months. And also we have this weekend, I mean, it's too late for this weekend, but Every three months, I have the group of about uh, 15 people. This weekend, we're a bit more um, who come together. And this group is people from the outside of the house, outside of the community, who for some reason don't want to or can't live in the community, but nevertheless have the interest that maybe you have. Mm -hmm. uh, but that group, um, I would say, is a very good reminder uh, and it would probably give you support. It's only four weekends in the year, 8% of the weekends of the year. So it's not a big commitment. Mm -hmm. Many people find it hard to give that much commitment. Even 8% of the weekends is too much for many people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Welcome, Andrea. Have we met before, Andrea? You just appeared in the meeting. Hello. <laughs> no, it's the first time for me. Okay. <laughs> yes, and I came too late. It didn't work with the link. I know. This tech stuff is always a bit like that, yeah? Okay. 
And are you living in Germany or somewhere else? Yes, I live in Germany, in Mönchengladbach. Ah, oh, you live around the corner. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> It's we not so far. Seen, we've been here 20 years, but we haven't seen you yet. So <laughs> your priority may not be quite so strong as it could be. Okay. Is that true? <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been here 20 years, and every so often somebody shows up from 20 minutes away. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I always wonder what they've been doing for 20 years. But anyway, I shouldn't say such strong things. I should be nice. I'm <laughs> not really very expert at being nice. I prefer provocation. This is my fun. You know, if I'm going to carry on teaching, but I can't do gin tonics anymore, I might as well uh, have some fun. Anyway, welcome. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, anything else? Okay. So I'm um, tonight I, I'm going to a little bit read from three of the chapters. So I'm re just been reading from the wave and the ocean. And now I'd read a little bit from living under a spell, because this is this is a, a way you can imagine how you got disidentified with existence, that you're living under a spell. Being identified with the I is a bit like playing a part in the movie. Let's say you're the villain. You put on a costume and you play your particular character according to the script. Gradually, this character becomes your day-to-day -day reality. You take on this role. And you call it my life. You do it quite unconsciously without ever really seeing what's happening. When you live without being identified with the I, you're not playing any role. It's like an absence of a character and life unfolds in present from moment to moment. It's so simple, you see. This is our natural state, our natural state is to live as the ocean, to live as consciousness. You see, this is, this is our nature. This is everybody's birthright, you can say. Every human being arrives on this planet with that very simple birthright, that in every moment of your life, you live in presence. I was very touched tonight. I, I often talk about my daughters. I've got these two amazing daughters who are now eight years old. And tonight, or today actually, one of my two daughters sent me a big letter. I was very surprised. I opened this letter and inside um, there was a painting, not really a painting. There was a drawing, I could say, a drawing. And I asked this little girl, well, what is this? So the first drawing was Papa. So she drew me as two eyes and a beard. She see, and she said, this is Papa. She's completely clear that that drawing is uh, Papa, which is two eyes and a beard. Very simple drawing, but she was very clear about that. And then on the next page, she had drawn Mummy and herself and her sister. And she told me, no legs, no legs. But actually, they didn't have even bodies. They didn't have any arms. She drew these guys, again, just with eyes and some squiggles around. You see? But she knew exactly that that squiggle was mummy and that squiggle was, was her, for example. And, you know, you can look at these two drawings and you think, well, this is just rubbish. You know, that's just rubbish. Or you can, you can hear this little girl 
expressing how she sees, for example, Papa as eyes and a beard. You know, it's not a bad uh, caricature of John David. She could put my glasses, of course, but um, I'm a beard and two eyes. Yeah, for her, for her. You see. And so when I look at that, you know, I get really touched because, you know, if you ask most kids to draw their father, they don't draw it like that, you see, because they know how to draw somebody. They've been already conditioned how to do a drawing, you know. And sometimes uh, you get kids, and I apparently got one of them, who is living very much in presence very much in the now. And when you meet this funny little girl, you can't help being touched because she makes you also feel present, you see. She just touches you because she reminds you in the way she treats you, in the strange things she says to you. She just makes you feel your own presence. It's very beautiful, actually. And so she's my secret agent now in the community some of you are coming this weekend you can you can meet this little girl if you haven't in the past and you can experience exactly what i'm saying and many of you i know have experienced her like that see so this is our birthright our birthright is to be completely in the moment nothing in the past nothing in the future just now and when you live in this now you become incredibly authentic you see incredibly authentic and this authenticism is very touching and this is the birthright of every human being very simple very natural nothing really spiritual it's just almost scientific you could say almost scientific What happens when we go to the cinema? Up until the movie starts, you are aware of your seat, your popcorn, your drink, and the empty screen. The lights go down and suddenly the screen is covered in colors and activity. At that point, you're aware that this is coming from the film projector. You notice that there isn't much popcorn left, and maybe you even spill your drink and feel a sticky patch on your sock. You understand that the film you're about to see is only a fantasy. When you get into the street at the end of the film, which is rather familiar, you feel normal again. Oh, it was only a movie. Everyone knows the movie in the cinema was just light passing through the plastic film. But what you see and experience when you emerge from the cinema, you take as real. I'm suggesting that what you call my life is actually only a film playing in your head and is about as real as the latest Harry Potter movie. You see. It's a bit shocking. You see, this is a bit shocking. And your mind will, will reject it. You see, your mind's going to reject this because this is a bit shocking. Of course, I understand. You know, of course, I understand. But of course, we don't understand. I mean, I, 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 what I'm saying tonight, I've been saying this nonstop every week for the last 20 years. So everybody on the screen knows this because they've heard me saying it many, many times, you see. But then you forget. You just so easily forget. The ego develops and gradually we perceive ourselves and the world from our particular story. This story is like a spell. It feels completely normal because we're 100% identified with our particular role in it. We are the main actor. We've designed our own costumes. We are producers 
and the directors. And of course, we are the main audience. Actually, we're the only audience because everyone else is busy creating and acting out their own stories, you see? It's a funny, funny situation, isn't it? And you can feel this when you're, maybe this is the answer to our friend from Potsdam, you know? All the people you meet are actually not interested in anything except their own movie. So you meet them, but they're actually watching their movie. They're busy with their movie, and you're maybe busy with your movie. So what kind of meeting can happen? When we are under the spell of the movie, we act out our part in a completely unconscious way. Our behavior always fits in with the particular story that we are in. We all know this. You see? So we're under a spell, you see, and maybe one day something happens, and in that moment, it's as if you've come out of the cinema into the street. So, so one at one moment, you realize that you've been living under a spell. But it's very difficult to see that you're living under a spell because everybody you meet is also living under a spell. And you can only see that you're living under a spell when you come out of the spell. You see. And therefore, you need some kind of um, external uh, person, probably, or situation, perhaps, that will kind of jolt you out of the spell, you see. And as soon as the spell dissipates, you can see the reality. And the reality is that you're living, you've been living in a fantasy. It's, it's very interesting. I spent many years traveling around, giving talks in uh, different cities all around all around Europe mainly, but also in other countries. I started teaching in Australia 30 something years ago. And uh, it doesn't make any difference where you go. You see, it's, it, the people are living the same way. And very rarely do you meet anybody who is living in presence, which is the most simple thing. And when you do meet somebody who lives in presence, your first uh, impression can be this person's a bit strange. This person's a bit strange, you see, because they're, they're not living under a spell. They're free of the spell. So they come over very strange, like my, uh, well, I think both my girls, but one of my two daughters in particular. She's, she, she disturbs you. She just disturbs you because you, you meet her and she doesn't act out out of her her movie you don't know what her movie is going to be she says incredible things last night quite late she went and did some lego and then she was painting in a book and i was silly enough to come and say hello what are you what are you doing and she says to me go away papa go away and she's completely angry that i disturbed her you see and i can say oh what's happening you know what, how can she say to her papa that go away papa you're just but i i can see in that moment it's completely true i just need to go away it's not my business to interfere in that moment she was completely in some moment very important moment for her you see, just before she went to bed so she constantly reminds me of these kind of things. You see, it's very easy because, of course, I've got a kind of bit conditioning about how you have to be a father. You know, fathers are meant to come to their daughters and say, "Hello, dear, what are you doing? Are you okay?" And whenever I do that, she says, "Go away, Papa." You see, she gets angry immediately because I'm disturbing her. It's very beautiful. It's always a bit shocking, but very beautiful and maybe I'm slowly learning you know that I'm not uh, supposed to act like that
Okay, so um, maybe have another pause, and then I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs from the chapter about the nervous taxi driver, the nervous taxi driver. So before I do that, anybody like to um, dialogue with me now? Take another dialogue break. Is that Lakshmi waving her arms? I don't know. Do you want to talk, Lakshmi, or you're just fixing your phone? I think it's just, just fixing your phone. So if you'd like to, you just have to do this. I think Atma is burning to say something. It's her uh, 21th birthday today, I think. Is it 21 today? Well, you're only 17. I, I always think you're very young. 26. 20 is, oh, you're getting old. You'll soon be 30, and then it's all over, you know. When you get to 30, that's pretty much the end, you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I I wanted to talk to you, but um, when when you ask this question, so when do you, someone wants to dialogue with you, then there is nothing <laughs> coming. But um, yeah, there was something. Hmm. You're kind of a person that annoys me a lot. Do you know that? I always get annoyed about you because actually what I've been saying tonight is something that in a way you have it. You have this kind of natural presence and you're constantly doing things which might appear a bit strange to other people. You're very authentic, actually. So this is very, very positive and, and very lovely, you know. But then you have this very annoying kind of saboteur where you're mostly saying no to life. So I don't know what exactly this no is about, you know. Maybe you would like to say, go away, Papa, but you never dared to say that to your father, you see. And so you had to compromise, maybe. And so there's some sort of anger inside you that for many years you had to compromise, even though you would love to have said, go away, Papa. You couldn't really say that because nice daughters don't say that to their father, you see. So you've been grown up in a certain kind of environment with a certain kind of accepted behavior. But actually, I'm not sure if that was ever really your uh, easy uh, behavior, you know. I think you have something inside which is actually quite natural and quite beautiful. But I don't know why you don't give this part of you so much credit. <laughs> Do you? Yeah, you, 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 you said it's simple. But it's, it's not. No, yeah, I. Very less credit. Why? Don't you see? The only reason is because you've allowed the society to condition you into a kind of robot. Yeah. But you don't like it. You don't really like it. So you have this constant no, this co constant re resistance inside you, you see? But to project this resistance onto John David is really like the stupidest thing you can do because I'm one of the few human beings you've probably ever met who you don't need to do that with. 
So you need to wake up a bit, you know. If you're, it's your birthday today, that's a perfect moment to wake up. Because, you know, in four <laughs> years' time, you're going to be too old. It'll all be over. So you've got very, very little time left. You see? So you just be authentic. Just be as you are, which is sometimes in your case very, very beautiful. I remember one morning I was hearing this flute music. And it was rather touching. And I didn't know who is playing this flute. Yeah. So I look out of my window, who's playing the flute? And there was this funny German woman playing her flute. To who? Who were you playing your flute? You were playing your flute to a parrot, right? So we got this beautiful white parrot, and you were playing your flute to the parrot, right? And you were very into it. And you weren't playing for anybody. You were just playing your flute for the parrot. You see, your lover, because he's somebody very close to you, you know? And I found this so beautiful, you see. It's completely beautiful because you don't care about the condition. You don't care about the movie. You're just in the moment playing your flute, which presumably you like playing, although you hardly ever play it in our in our band. Um, and there you are, and you're you're having this delicious moment together with a parrot. You see? So this is, this is something you can say, wow, isn't that great? I can play my flute to a parrot, you know? It's okay, you know? This part of you is very, very lovely. And if you want a birthday present, I can say your birthday present is to give yourself the complete uh, authority that you're going to be living in this present. And you're going to act in each moment of the presence in your own unique way, which is maybe what you wanted to do all your life, but you never somehow became free of, of old movies. You have some strong old movies, and somehow they influence you very strongly. Is that right? Yeah. Right. So, I mean, you, you know, in, in a strange way, you came to this community. You had left your kind of movie back in Hamburg. You'd left your rather wet movie because Hamburg's a bit like England. It always rained. And then you'd gone off around the world because you wanted to kind of break out. You know, I want to break out and uh, go somewhere where I can just be myself, you know. I don't know where you went, but anyway, you went off around the world, uh, probably not right around, but you went here or there. And at the end of it, you didn't feel that you really became free enough. And then I can't remember how you showed up at the Open Sky House, but somehow you came to the house. How did you actually find us? I don't remember quite. I, I just Googled spiritual community. <laughs> yeah. and why In the internet. Here? In the internet, I just um, was writing Spiritual Community Germany. Okay. Then I found it. <laughs> and why were you doing that? Because um, I wanted to do yoga every morning with the, some people together and live together with people. That was the reason. <laughs> okay. So now you've been here for about two years. And in this two years, you've done probably yoga, you know, every morning you wanted to do it. But why the resistance? You, see? you chose to come here. You chose to come to a community. Something inside me chose it. The other part not. Right. So which part is more important? Yeah. Do you want to be identified with a wave or do you want to be identified with the with the ocean? When I when I put it to you like that, the answer is absolutely clear. Yeah. <laughs> what you want, you know, or the, something inside you wanted that. But you're allowing the wave part to sabotage the ocean part. And so you come over as a silly young woman, actually. Sorry. But that's not really your that's not really who you are. You're not a silly young woman. 
but you need to give more energy to the part which is the ocean. So give yourself a birthday present and, and say to yourself in a deep way that now is the moment I stop living in the way as a wave and I'm going to live as the total consciousness. Very beautiful, very simple. It's not, you don't need to read hundreds of books about it. It's, I mean, you know, I, I read it out in a five, five minutes. It's enough. You don't need any other teachings. If you just follow that, that's enough. And the beautiful thing about Ramana Mahashi <clears throat> is that he has this tiny little book called Nanya, Who Am I? I should have also added it in tonight as part of the books. So Nanya is, I think, 26 or 28 questions and answers, which he gave to some person uh, when he was a young man of about 20, younger than you. And these answers he gave contain all the wisdom you need, all the spiritual wisdom you need. But we don't need to even call it spiritual. It's just the wisdom. It's just the natural wisdom. You see? So it's not complicated. It's not, uh, you, you know, it's not, you don't need to study for years. It's very simple. So now you're getting very old, you're 26, you can make a decision, you know. Now you make a new decision in your life. You've got no mamas and papas on your shoulder. Or if they're still there, you pick them off. And you make a clear decision inside yourself that you're going to live in presence as the ocean. You're living like that anyway. You can't, you can't not be in the ocean, actually. This is a sort of slightly funny joke, you know, or funny paradox, you know. We're busy searching for the ocean because we identify with a wave. So we're busy looking for the ocean. But you can't not be the ocean. How can you how can you not be the ocean? I mean, you it's not a choice. It's like everybody's the ocean. It's very simple. And I think you're somebody who knows this, actually. I always felt you know this. But you're so much of a wave girl that you drive me <laughs> I can surf a bit on the wave. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> try and you probably get drowned, drowned or something. Right? Or a shark will come and eat you. That's better. <laughs> I'll send a shark to eat you. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's really good. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading recently, there was some man swimming in the ocean and there were a whale, not a, not a shark, but a whale came, you know, and opened its mouth and took this man inside. He was swallowed by the whale. But after only a very short time, the whale didn't like the taste and he was um, sent out, you know, he was sent out of the whale's mouth. So the whale took him in and then got a shock and spat him out. It was an experience, you know, I was eaten by a whale. Mm. Yeah. Oh my. So you have to be careful when you go to Spain because you might get eaten by a whale. <laughs> Okay, good. Okay, anybody else like to have a dialogue? We have a bit more time because I started late tonight. Okay, so I've got a little bit more. So there's another chapter in this first chapter, sub sub-chapter called what is it called? The Nervous Taxi Driver. The Nervous Taxi Driver. <clears throat> so how to get out of this situation, you see? My suggestion is bringing more meditation and silence 
into your daily life would be very helpful. We are so programmed to relate and to tell our story, how we feel, how we would like it to be, and couldn't we just change it all and blah, blah, blah. We have so many important things that we have to put out into the world. <clears throat> we want everybody to know our strong feelings about everything. The invitation is to stay with the silent part, to look and find out what doesn't change. <clears throat> to really get in touch with that, you will find it helps to be quiet, not to be talking or activating the stories and structures. When you are more, when you, when you are more empty and quiet, you'll be able to see for yourself what is going on. This is called self-awareness. And it's important for you now to develop this quality. So first to become silent, to become not really interested in telling stories, and out of this silence, you start to per perceive inside yourself what is going on, right? So self-awareness is like the gate to freedom, the gate to freedom, self-awareness, that you can watch what is going on, you see? And if you watch what is going on because you become quiet enough that you can watch it, then you can't get caught up in your ego. You can't really get caught up. Maybe you still get caught up in the beginning, but if you continue with the silence, if you continue with the meditation, if you simplify your life, then you can't get caught up. But it takes time. It takes a priority. It takes a decision. A passenger, so this is this is this is the kind of funny joke, but it's not really a joke in the end. It's a tragedy. This is what I'm going to read now is a kind of tragedy of humanness. A passenger in a taxi leaned over to ask the driver a question and tapped him on the shoulder. The driver screamed, lost control of the taxi, nearly hit a bus drove up over the curb and stopped just close to a large plate glass window. For a few minutes, everything was silent in the cab, in the taxi. And then, still shaking, the driver said, I'm sorry, but you scared the daylights out of me. The frightened passenger apologized to the driver and said she didn't realize a mere tap on the shoulder would frighten you that much the driver replied no no i'm sorry it's entirely my fault today is my first day driving a taxi i've been driving a hearse for the last 25 years see a hearse is a, a vehicle where you put dead bodies you see so his job for 25 years is carrying dead bodies around and now he's working as a taxi driver. And the guy taps him on the shoulder. So he freaks out, he completely freaks out. Why does he freak out? Because he thinks he still thinks he's driving a, 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 the, the, the hearse, driving the, the, the truck for, for dead bodies, you see. And this is what happens. We get so conditioned that if somebody taps you on the shoulder, you freak out, you see. When that whole structure dissolves, you simply are who you are from moment to moment. There's no longer anything inside that is saying, I'm okay or I am not okay. If something happens during the day, you will respond to that situation. 
in that moment in a way that will be unique to you. Everything will respond to the situation. Everybody will respond to the situation in a different way. So there's another joke just to finish tonight. Another joke. Two monks were washing their bowls in the river when they noticed a scorpion that was drowning. One monk immediately scooped it up and set it upon the bank. In the process, he was stung. He went back to washing his bowl and again the scorpion fell into the river. The monk saved the scorpion and was again stung. The other monk asked him, brother, why do you continue to save the scorpion when you know its nature is to sting? Because, the monk replied, it is my nature to save it. I hope you get it. Okay, so that's uh, just about it for tonight, I think. So this book, is, this book is very, very simple to read. If you don't have a copy, you can get a copy from the Open Sky Press website, or you can get it from Amazon. And um, <clears throat> very simple book, and actually very easy to read. It was, I, I guess I must have spoken most of this book in various meetings. And the whole idea of the book is that it's very simple. Another, another little dialogue with somebody. Okay, so I would like to little advertise um, a workshop that's happening in uh, two weeks time. Uh, it's with Rada, who is right in the middle of the screen right now with her hand on her face. That's Rada. And on the 20th of June to the 23rd of June in two weeks time, two weekends time, she's offering a Tantra weekend. Um, what are you calling it? Maybe you'd like a, to say a few words about it? Well, the weekend is basically an invitation to become present. <laughs> um, so it's an invitation to slow down and to become aware of what's going on inside you if you encounter and meet people and um yeah it's a very beautiful weekend which opens the heart and um where there's a protected space to explore to just to explore what's inside you and recently you got a very nice website i think what, what is what is the address of your website um www.tantrawithradat.org Tantra with Radha, very nice. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Tantra with Radha, and it's a simple but very clear website. And, and um, her Tantra weekend is called something like... Conscious Touch, conscious, Meeting in Presence. Meeting in Presence, Conscious Touch, you see. Mm -hmm. Very lovely. So uh, if, if you have time that weekend, I can strongly... She's been doing one day... Um, workshops to build up to a whole weekend and now she's ready I think it'll be a very nice weekend so I can uh, 
strongly recommend it. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so I think that's kind of it. Thank you. And we will have another meeting next Thursday at the same time, eight o'clock. <clears throat>